We headed out into the Pacific Ocean, 200 miles off the coast of California, to pick up the trade wind that would carry us down toward the equator. Salisbury and his party made the round-the-world expedition aboard the Gypsy. It was a yacht 161 feet long. It had a crew of 18, and there were 13 scientists aboard. We had a laboratory for the development of moving picture film and the preservation of specimens to be collected, an ice machine, and we were well stocked for a long cruise in the tropics. But just before reaching the equator, you run into the doldrums. That's a vast expanse of water where there is very little, if any, wind. We had a diesel engine, and we turned on our power and had no difficulty getting across this quiet expanse of ocean. The boys during that time mended everything but their ways. And here you see Captain Salisbury's cleaners at work. And boy, could they clean. They invented the game of blackjack. And they had me clean the first day in the tropics. Very few of the sailors today know the knots that are necessary in the making of a hammock. This old fellow had been a deep water sailor. He had been to the tropics before. And he knew that a very necessary part of the equipment was a hammock. When you pick up these clouds, known as the trade clouds, on the other side of the doldrums, you know that you're just about to get the trade wind that will carry you onto the equator. And when that shot of the sun was taken, we were just 75 miles northeast of the Marquesas group. Each man wanted to be the first to sight land, so he appointed himself a lookout. The Marquesas Group is to be our first destination. It belongs to the French and is formed by a number of small islands. The missionaries compel the men to wear cotton pants and shirts, and they put hideous Mother Hubbard wrappers on the women. The natives were not accustomed to this. They became very warm. Their clothing became saturated with perspiration. And they'd sit in the cool trade winds. The wind blowing through the wet cloth gave them colds. And this turned into pneumonia. And thousands of them died. Today, I doubt very much if there are 300 Marquesans left. They lead a carefree life, these Marquesans, getting as much joy as possible out of each day. They don't need fish hooks, they use spears underwater. And a Marquesan always gets his fish. Fish are very plentiful, and the Marquesan is clever. That's a good combination. Frying pans, what use? They eat them raw. And I guess the fish, if given his choice, would rather be bitten by the white teeth of a Marquesan maiden than the teeth of a hungry shark. At least I would. On shore, we found fruits and vegetables growing in profusion. This is the mango, a very delicious tropical fruit, if you don't object to the slight taste of turpentine. But that taste is very slight. You don't notice it after you've eaten the fruit several days. It's delicious, and you don't care how much juice runs down your chin and inside of your shirt. And believe me, that's plenty. The breadfruit grows on a fine, large tree. It's a staple article of diet of the Marquesan. Flowers were everywhere and of every imaginable color. And there's another beautiful thing found in the Marquesas group. The girls. They're lovely. They're just happy grown-up children. They spend their days dancing, 
swimming and singing on the beach. They wear a single garment called a periu. It's about twice as wide as a bath towel and twice as long. They take this and give it a quick flip around their bodies and tuck under the ends. There are no buttons or hooks or pins or suspenders, but I'm darned if I ever saw one of them fall off. And believe me, I watch carefully. Someday when the picking is good, this girl ought to pick herself a shirtwaist. It's a lucky captain that can visit one of these islands and get away with his entire crew. Because some of the boys are tempted to desert. But you can't blame the fellas. The girls are friendly. It's really a great place for a young man. Or for an old man with young ideas. We had no difficulty getting these girls to dance, but it was difficult to get them to stop. Whenever they heard music and saw the camera set up, they danced. Well, they insisted on getting into the picture. We're going to let them wriggle out of it the best way they can. The natives told us that it rains every day in the year in Samoa. But it generally takes the form of hard showers at night. Plenty of sunshine during the day results in a luxurious growth of tropical vegetation. Part of the coast of Samoa, of the island of Tutuila, is rocky, which may differ from your idea of a South Sea Island beach. But they have these palm-lined beaches, and whenever you find one, you generally find a collection of native huts. To be a good South Sea Island dancer requires years of training. You have to start almost from the cradle. This little kitty got a pretty early start. But imagine exercising like this in the hot sun when you don't have to. The sitting Siva dance of the women of Samoa, according to Robert Louis Stevenson, who spent a great many years in the South Seas and who is buried in the Samoan group, is the most graceful dance in the world. Every movement made by these women tell a story. They tell of their past lives, of their present existence, and of their hopes and fears for the future. The women are good dancers in Samoa, but the men are better. The women have a few tasks to perform. But when America took possession of Samoa, the men learned that in America the politicians didn't work. So all the men in Samoa have become politicians. They don't work, all they do is dance and talk politics. And in their dance, their movements tell of the history of Samoa. The Samoans kept no written record of their history. All of the incidents were handed down from one generation to another in the movements of the Siva. It must be very interesting to one who can interpret the movements of this dance. Now you've had your glimpse of Polynesia, you've seen the natives, and you've seen the happy, carefree lives they lead. Now you can compare all this with what you're going to find in Melanesia, for we're just about to cross the 180th meridian, and we'll be among the blacks. It's in Melanesia we find the cannibals and the headhunters. Our first stop will be at the Fiji Islands, a British crown colony. Seventy-five years ago, to speak of the Fiji Islands brought up visions of cannibalism. But today, according to the British government and the missionaries, cannibalism has ceased. The natives are trained to police the islands of the group wherever there are whites. It may be possible that the Fiji Islander, living so close to the dividing line between Polynesia and Melanesia, has uh, had the Melanesian blood softened by the Polynesian strain and proves more susceptible to the influences of civilization. The children are very intelligent looking considering the fact that their grandparents were cannibals, but they had the queerest types of haircut. Each one had his or her idea of beauty in a haircut. This girl washed her hair that morning and couldn't do a thing with it. And this fellow cuts his hair with a hammer and a chisel. 
They just reverse our method of building a house. They build the framework of the roof and lift it and then build the under part of the hut. Then they thatch the whole thing with palm leaves, and grass, and reeds. And it may surprise you to know that a hut built in this way is waterproof. The uh, rainfall in the Fijis is very heavy. They have a great many bananas in this group. Practically all the bananas used in Australia and New Zealand are shipped from the Fiji Islands. They break each banana from the bunch and pack it separately. The bananas are brought down the rivers on great bamboo rafts. After the raft is unloaded, it's burned. For it's a great deal easier to go back up the river and build another raft than it would be to pull this one back up the swift current. Their fish lines and nets are made of coconut fiber. That's a very valuable article in the South Seas. This old fellow is making a line of coconut fiber that he will later weave into a fish net. a shell hook tied with coconut fiber to a pearl oyster shell attractor makes a very good fish lure for the large saltwater game fish. A Fiji Island sailing canoe would give you nervous prostration. It's a long narrow canoe held upright by an outrigger. The sail is made of grass cloth and the lines and halyards are made of coconut fiber. When the wind blows very hard, it's necessary for the passengers to ride out on the outrigger to prevent the canoe turning over. But it's a speedy craft and safe if you know how to distribute your weight in a blow. The most interesting part of it, though, is their method of maneuvering. They go as far as they want in any direction, and when they want to retrace their course, they don't come up into the wind with a lot of fuss and bother like a white man. They merely change the position of the sail. And then the bow becomes the stern, and the stern becomes the bow. And merrily they sail along on the way home. The clever white man hasn't thought of that. I think we secured the only moving picture ever made of a tidal wave. You'll notice the water rushes in and covers those reefs to a depth of 11 or 12 feet in a very few minutes. On many of the low islands, a great deal of damage was done, and some of the natives lost their lives. Some of the South Sea Islands are only three or four feet above high water mark. Port sliding down this natural chute on a hot day. But it was so hard on the elbows, we couldn't sit down for about a week. And the women become very expert boatmen. They do all of the hard work in Melanesia, which includes the Fiji Island. You think a Melanesian would make a woman do any part of the hard work? No, sir. He makes her do it all. Women carry the wood, the man carries the axe. <laughs> These women are making tapa cloth, the only cloth they had for garments prior to the arrival of the trader. And the edge of one piece pounded into the edge of the other. In this way, they can make a piece of any desired size. We saw some of the chief's trains that were 75 feet long. And with vegetable dyes, they stencil on the designs using a palm leaf for a stencil. The Fiji Islanders always give everyone of importance a feast. They thought we were important because we came with an expedition. We wanted to see what it was all about, so we didn't dispel their illusion. They dig a hole and fill it with rocks, which they get very hot. They put leaves on top of the rocks, the food on top of the leaves, more leaves over the food, and then cover everything with dirt. 
Pigs, chicken, fish, turtles, everything imaginable goes into that fire hole. And the food cooked that way is very delicious if you can just forget that they haven't cleaned anything. But before you eat, you must go through the kava ceremony and like it. Kava is a peppery root that is mixed up with water with a great deal of ceremony. Now, can you imagine drinking that stuff he's washing his hands in? He said he was straining it, but I noticed his hands were a great deal cleaner when he got through than when he started. The guest drinks this vile mixture from a coconut shell bowl. And brother, if you think a coconut shell doesn't hold a lot, you try it sometime. After the guest drinks, he spins the bowl and the others applaud. It looked like a lot of hooey to us. Here's Chief Rambezi in his long top of cloth train. <whistles> the chief is followed by his warriors dressed in leaves, bark, top of cloth, and grass. That's the national costume of the Fiji Island warrior. They have a very nice custom of giving presents. They gave us a great many presents, a great many sweet potatoes. They call them yams, and some of them reach a weight of 50 pounds. Then the women arrive, bringing more presents, more sweet potatoes. We had enough sweet potatoes aboard the yacht when we left the Fiji Islands to stock all the markets in the state. In the sitting Siva dance of the women of the Fijis, as in the sitting Siva in Samoa, those movements tell a story. The women wear shirtwaists made of grass, leaves, and flowers. Those are made fresh every day. I think that's a very nice custom. Captain Salisbury remarked during the progress of this dance that he should like very much to have one of those tapa cloth skirts. At the conclusion of the dance, all the women filed past him, and each woman took off her skirt and presented it to him. Every woman had another skirt underneath. The women are good dancers, but remember, they do all the work. They have less time to dance than have the men. The men are all warriors. They haven't had a war for 75 years. Nevertheless, they're warriors, and they won't work. All they do is dance. And are they good? They've got to be good. They go through this dance of the war clubs, requiring hours, hundreds of intricate movements, absolutely without music, not even the beating of a tom-tom. We watched them for hours and didn't see one mistake or hesitation on the part of a dancer. I doubt very much if anywhere in the world is a ballet as perfect in synchronized movement as these warriors of the Fijis dancing the dance of the war clubs. They keep time very much as a musician keeps time on his instrument. They told us that they always dance this dance of the war clubs before starting on a raid. Perhaps for the same reason that the North American Indian danced his war dance before he went on the war path. Now note their features. Remember, 75 years ago, the Fiji Islanders were cannibals. We leave the land of the Baddocks and travel up this Malacca Strait in search of new adventure. We pass the Nicobar Islands on the left, and we approach the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal, where we found the pygmies, the Jarawayan pygmies, perhaps the most primitive people on Earth. We were very fortunate in finding this a collection of natives who had lost their fear of the white man and their enmity for him. These pygmies on the Andaman Islands are man killers. The men are about four feet in height, the women about three feet eight inches. You can get a comparison there. The man is about five feet eight. 
This is a full-grown man and woman. And when they meet, they shake hands as we do, and the visitor sits on the host's lap. And they carry on a conversation that sounds like the shattering of magpies. And they showed us their games. They play blind man's buff and leapfrog. There was a forester located on this island in the interest of the British government. And he told us that back in the jungle and even down on the beach when the wilder creatures came down to salt water that they played these games. It's really a mystery where they learned them. And they let the devil or the evil spirits out of the children by puncturing their flesh in thousands of places with a piece of sharp clamshell. Practically all of the adults' bodies were literally covered with those scars. They have a custom of wearing some part of the mate's head when he dies. Some of the widows wore the jawbone only but others preferred the whole skull. It's a custom that has its merits because you can easily tell a widow. Of course, you can't tell a widow very much, but you know who's who and you can watch her step. But imagine making love to a woman that wears the skull of her departed husband hanging on her breast. Reports had come out of the Andaman Islands that these pygmies had tails. That is one reason that Captain Salisbury's expedition went to the islands to secure pictures of the natives. They're very primitive. As I stated, perhaps the most primitive humans on earth, for they have never learned to build a fire. They eat all of their food raw, and it's a very primitive race indeed that has uh, no habitation or hut. But they live in trees wherever night overtakes them. And we were very fortunate indeed to be able to get these uh, creatures because it's only occasionally that they come down to the salt water in search of turtle. But these, uh, the natives we show you, had made friends with this forester. And he understood their language and uh, acted as an interpreter. And in that way, we understood the uh, ceremonies that they showed us and what they signified. A turtle on his back is absolutely helpless. You can go away and leave it and come back and find it just where you left it. Their canoe is merely a hollowed log held upright by an outrigger. A girl formally marks her transition from girlhood to womanhood by adorning her body with a costume of designs drawn in clamshell line. Rather disabled, but the girls are very proud of their makeup. The costume consists of the design on the forehead and the design on the body, a little grass behind, and not much before. The girl at the left has an open face, wide open in fact. We never knew whether she was smiling at us or getting ready to bite. Now there's another ceremony that they must pass through before they are considered fit to be women. It consists of being kept wet for three days with cold seawater while the older women fan her. If she doesn't die of pneumonia, she's considered fit. And then they showed us their wedding ceremony where the groom sits in the bride's lap. The members of the immediate family form in a summer circle around the couple. 
After a while, the friends arrive. They act more like enemies, but they're supposed to be friends. And they go into a football huddle around the couple and howl like dogs for about an hour. And then they showed us the wedding dance, the dance that makes the couple man and wife. Well, they thought they had given us a good show. One day, they made their way up this trail into the jungle. A jungle so thick that a white man must cut every foot of his way. Going up this waterway, we told them goodbye. Now we're going to take you to one more group of erstwhile cannibals. These are the Papuans occupying islands along the coast of New Guinea. And according to the Australian government and the missionaries, the Papuans were cannibals from 13 to 18 years ago. Here the missionaries have done a very good work. They have raised these natives from the very depth of primitive existence up the scale of civilization to where, where they are quite civilized in action, if not in dress. They load catamarans with these pots and set sail on a trading expedition. The catamaran is a couple of hollow logs with a platform of bamboo. The mast stepped over to one side, and the crew composed very often of women and boys. Now they have to wait for the wind to blow from the right direction to take them where they want to go, for it's impossible to maneuver these catamarans. Then at the other end, they sometimes wait for months for the wind to blow from the right direction to bring them home. So you can see the schedule of a traveling man in New Guinea is rather uncertain. I doubt very much if you'll ever see another picture of these crab claw grass cloth sails. They're called crab claw sails on account of the shape, and they're made of grass cloth woven by the women. It takes the women months to make one of these sails. It was the only material they had for sail making prior to the arrival of the trader. But he brought cotton duck and he had very little sails resistance to overcome to get the natives to substitute the cotton duck for the grass cloth. That also released the women from sail making to the gathering of ivory nuts and other things for which the traders were willing to give trade goods. But these sails are very fragile. If they become damp, they mildew, and if they mildew, they're very easily torn by the wind. So today, I doubt very much if you will see a dozen of these sails left along the coast of New Guinea. And it's the only place in the world where these crab claw, grass claw sails were found. Well, when they reach their destination, they run the catamaran up as far as they can on the beach at high tide. And when the tide goes out, it leaves their craft high and dry. And they can do their trading right on the catamaran. There's a lot of fuss and bother when they reach a port because they must lower these sails and furl them and carry them ashore and keep them covered. Or as I stated, they're very fragile, and if they become damp, they mildew. The arrival of one of these trading expeditions is quite a social event. 
on this part of the New Guinea coast, visitors are few and far apart. Building your houses in this way has its advantages because when the tide goes out, it leaves a good yard for the kiddies to play in, and when the tide comes in, it gives the backyard a good cleaning. Their schoolroom is a great outdoors, and they're going to their reading, writing, and arithmetic in a big way. The missionary teachers told us that they very seldom had to mark a student absent. We're going to take you first to the islands of the New Hebrides group. This is a French and British possession. Now, when we approach a cannibal island, it's advisable to anchor the boat off a wide beach so that when you go ashore in your small boats, the water's edge will be quite a ways from the jungle. You won't see the natives at first. They'll be back in the bush watching you just as suspiciously, perhaps, as you'll watch them. And they have very good reason to be suspicious of a white man. You may have to spend several days at the water's edge displaying trinkets before the natives come out of the bush. They first send out the small boys. And if nothing happens to the small boys, then the men come out. They'll bring out pigs and chickens, vegetables and fruit to trade for the trinkets they know we'll have for them. These are real cannibals. They're the Melanesian type. And the pipe was the favorite article we had. They uh, wanted some paint. The only thing we had was enamel. They took it and painted their faces with it. It was guaranteed not to come off with steam or hot water, so I guess they're still wearing it. They have the mentality of three or four-year-old children and the bodies of adults. These hats were supposed to frighten undesirable visitors away from their island, and they didn't want us to go back into the interior. This always worked on the superstitious tribes from other islands, but naturally it had no effect on us, so they finally gave it up and disappeared in the jungle. Sometime later, when we followed them, we found their village, a very evil, vile-smelling place. We found the men and boys living in a compound by themselves. The women live with the pigs. The man's compound is absolutely taboo to women. If a woman enters a man's compound, she is killed instantly. That may sound silly in this day of civilization, but I assure you it's one of the many brutal customs practiced by the cannibals of the New Hebrides. A cannibal has one virtue. He will generally tell the truth. We asked these fellows if they had eaten human flesh, and they grinned and grunted and readily admitted it. But they also admitted that they preferred the flesh of the black man to that of the white man. They claim that a white man smells bad and tastes salty. And that is very likely true because every race has its own particular body musk. note of the tom-tom has called in these savages from all over the island for this ceremony and deep in the jungle they have clearings called sing sing grounds where they hold their hideous feasts the cannibal woman is not permitted to eat human flesh but she prepares it for cooking these ceremonies starts with a dance early in the morning. It starts in an orderly manner, but as the hours go by, the men become frenzied. 
They tear their hair, they scream like demons, tear off their covering, if any, and they dance until they fall exhausted. They're kicked out of the way and others take their places. The whole spectacle is a very disgusting and revolting one to a white man. Then in the afternoon, they bring in the pigs. They sacrifice some of the male pigs to the gods, and the men dance with the female pigs. They go through many repulsive and obscene actions, which naturally the censors would not permit us to show in a moving picture theater. We show this ceremony up to the point where the censors compelled us to cut it. We were at Malakula Island about 10 days before we could get these natives out of the jungle in a group. They'd come out one or two at a time, but we wanted a group picture. It was impossible to go back in the jungle and photograph them due to the fact that the light at noon is just like twilight. This is due to the dense vegetation. We finally got them out on the beach and made pictures of the boys first. Boys are not too hard looking, although they do have very cruel eyes and treacherous mouths. But the uh, adults are very fierce and very treacherous. Every man wears a piece of bamboo through the cartilage of the nose. And among these savages, too, the uh, pipe was the favorite article. We have found that no matter how primitive a race, it knows how to smile. You're apt to wonder when a cannibal smiles at you what he's thinking, and you're pretty apt to hope he isn't thinking of calories. Here's a jolly little playmate. Many of them had guns, and they claimed that they had killed white men for them. You can believe this because it's about the only way they can get a gun. It's a very serious crime against the British government to sell them guns or ammunition. And that's the thing that they want more than anything else. Missionary boat put into this bay and cannibals came out to the missionary boat to listen to the organ. They call it the Sing Sing Bacchus. They can't say box, they say Bacchus. Now these being the best dressed men in the tribes, we decided to have a style show. We're going to show you what the well-dressed cannibal will wear this year. Captain Salisbury had made a previous trip to this island, and he had a copy of Asia containing pictures of these men which he had taken. They got a great bang out of seeing their own pictures in that publication. Solomon Islands belong to the British, and here we found both cannibals and headhunters. There's a large island of Malata in this group, and years ago the bush cannibals drove the shore cannibals away. The survivors took up refuge on coral reefs that surround this island of Malata, and during the past several hundred years they've been going back to the mainland, bringing out canoe loads of rocks and dirt. They've built those small islands up until they can live on them very comfortably. A little picking and he isn't much out to the old man, but he looks good in the picture. This fellow showed us what would happen if he sat one inch off balance in this little ten pound canoe. But he could climb into that canoe over the gunwale a hundred times without capsizing it. That's quite a stunt. There wasn't a member of our party that could sit in that canoe and paddle it one minute without capsizing it. The men on the small islands are known as saltwater men. All the small islands are protected by rock walls. These walls serve two purposes. They protect the inhabitants from the raids of the cannibals and headhunters from the other islands. 
and they also protect them from the storms. Life in the Western Pacific is pretty much a case of the survival of the fittest. The boys are diving here for trinkets and tobacco cans, but they dive in the same manner for the clam shell, which is used in making the shell money, the medium of exchange of the Solomon Islands. This clam shell money is not a coin, it's an ornament, but it's highly valued by all the tribes. Most of the tribes are too lazy to make it. Men on these small islands never go to the mainland. They're afraid of the bush cannibals. But once a week, they send the women over with the fish they catch in these fish traps and shell money to trade with the bush cannibals for vegetables and fruits, things they are unable to produce on the small islands. The bush cannibals declare this truce once a week. The women set sail on a trading expedition. We followed to see what would happen, and as it happened so often in life, nothing happened. The bush cannibals came out of the interior, the men carrying nothing, the women heavily laden. And they met the women coming over from the small islands. Now we're going to show you the Solomon Island cannibals. You'll notice that he looks cleaner and more intelligent. But I assure you that he's just as treacherous, just as bloodthirsty, and just as fond of human flesh as the cannibals of the New Hebrides. In fact, these men have a very evil reputation. They're known as killers. I believe they'd kill uh, their father for a half a string of shell money. The British government is constantly sending expeditions after these men. Not long ago, the uh, natives of this village killed the crew of a trading schooner. And the uh, government sent a gunboat out, shell this village, and kill some of these men. Those that they capture, they take to their settlement at Tulegi, where they have a stockade and a gallows, and where they're executed. It's very possible that some of the very men you see in this picture have been either killed or captured. When they reach the shore, the women drop exhausted from their hard journey, but the men dance for hours. They dance to the music of the most primitive instrument of man, the hollow log. To the rhythm that comes from this log, when men beat it, these fellows dance. You notice some of them are wearing undershirts. We traded our undershirts for war clubs and spears. When we left this island, we had plenty of weapons, but were short on underclothes. Now we'll take you over and give you a glimpse of Tulegi, the headquarters of the British in the Solomons. Just a handful of British and uh, a number of native guards populate this small settlement. Here is where they can find the cannibals they capture after depredations against the white man. And they give them the little necktie party on this gallows. It's always a very splendid lesson to the man they hang, but it doesn't seem to make any impression at all on the others. We went in too close to this island, and the current put us ashore on that reef. It was necessary to lighten the boat. We went ashore and took up our headquarters in a hut. This sacred bush turkey is a very ambitious bird. Whenever she wants to lay an egg, she digs a hole four feet deep, deposits her egg in the hole, and then fills the hole with sand. The heat of the sand hatches the egg, and the little chick is forced to make its way up through four feet of sand to the surface. It emerges fully feathered and glances around, locates the jungle, and flies away almost immediately. It receives no care at all from the parent bird.
The natives gather the eggs, but they never kill the birds themselves. We soon ran out of presents after going ashore on this island, and the men became very surly and sullen. They got off at the jungle's edge and glared at us. When we saw these fellows coming in from other islands and other parts of this island dressed in their war paint and carrying their weapons and putting on these dances, we knew what it was all about. We had been among cannibals long enough to know that this meant that we should get that boat off the reef and get our things aboard and set sail. We got our things aboard and took some shots with the telephoto lens of these dances and then were on our way. Our first view of the headhunters showed them shooting fish, literally shooting fish. Then the cannibal he has a higher mentality, that of a six or eight year old child. He keeps himself in splendid physical condition. They bind their ankles loosely and are able to go up these trees like a monkey on a stick. Only a man in splendid physical condition can perform this stunt. Or they run up the trees in this fashion, with their ankles unbound. The coconut tree is a very valuable plant in the South Seas. I doubt very much if the natives could exist five years without it. The fronds of the palm furnish coverings for their huts. The natives eat the meat of the coconut and drink the milk. And coconut fiber has hundreds of uses. For everything that we use, wires, screws, pins, tacks, paste, nails, they use coconut fiber. Then another uh, vegetable that is very valuable is the climbing vine. They use this when they need a heavier binding to take the place of rope. And two men with several loops of this vine can go to the top of the tallest tree, no matter how large the tree is in diameter. The man below passes the loop to the man above. And when they want to come down, they use a long length of this, get it between their toes to act as a brake, and they slide down. Every stalk of the traveler's palm contains a drink of cold, pure water. It's quite the purest water found in that part of the world. They make fire, as do many primitive races, by rubbing hard and soft wood together. This friction produces a heat that in turn produces a spark which they place in the tinder, in this case coconut fiber, just another use for the coconut tree. And by blowing on this spark, they have a fire almost as quickly as we could make one with a match. They don't have to do this very often. They keep their fires burning month after month. Never let them go out. The canoes of the headhunters are not the crude hollowed logs of the cannibals, but they're constructed more scientifically. They cut the boards to a good shape and fit with crude stone implements, bore holes along the edges, and then laced the boards together using vegetable fiber. And then with a the nut that grows there, they waterproof the seams. They rub it on a rock, fill in the cracks, and it acts as a waterproof cement. We saw canoes that had been in use 35 years. They were just as seaworthy as the day they were made. The chewer of the beetle nut puts a piece of the nut in his mouth, some lime from his lime pot, and a piece of wild pepper leaf. And boy, he gets the kick of a mule. His hard action goes up a number of beats. They're very proud of their personal appearance. They put lime in their hair to kill the insects and then comb them out with those bamboo combs. And when they shave, 
They use a pair of clamshell tweezers and pull the whiskers out by the roots. It doesn't seem to cause them any discomfort at all. I doubt very much if they have the same nervous system that we have. I think he missed one. When the boys are five or six years old, they're taken from the mothers and kept in the compound with the men. And they're taught how to handle their weapons and the steps of the war dances. For it is the desire of every headhunter to be a good warrior. And when nine years old, they pierce his ear with a thorn. They keep increasing the size of this plug until the earlobes are stretched enough to hold a couple of tin cans, and he's all dressed up. You'll notice the lobe of the ear goes entirely around the can. The old men make ornaments of clamshell and tortoiseshell. This fellow has a piece of coconut fiber tied to his big toe, and he's working down a tortoiseshell ornament. And notice his earlobes. That tortoiseshell ornament goes over a clamshell backing, and that is worn on the forehead of a chief. The part of the picture showing Gao's rise to power and the great raid that followed was reenacted for Captain Salisbury by Gao and his tribes. This is a very important event in the history of the headhunter. But we photographed it not because of its historical importance, but because it is perhaps the only opportunity that civilized people will have of seeing actual headhunters engaged in a raid in the headhunter country and over the ground that the original action took place. were taken from their places of concealment in the jungle, for the headhunters must keep these canoes concealed because the English destroy them whenever they're found. The English know that they'll only be used at the time of a raid, and every raid is a very bloody affair. They all gathered at Bilwa for a great council of war, all the chiefs and their warriors. And at this council, the plan of action was discussed. And it was also decided that only the young men should be taken on the raid. That this didn't please the old fellows. They wanted to go. This old man pointed to the ring on his breast. He said, that shows I've killed a chief. And for every ring on my arm, I've got a skull in my skull house. Headhunters take the heads of their enemies as a religious ceremony. If anything of an unfortunate nature occurs, such as the stealing of that girl or the shipwrecking of a canoe, they think their god, the Uri Uri, is angry, and that they must secure heads of their enemies to pacify him. It's 150 miles to the island of Savo, where their enemies reside. These men are great paddlers. They take advantage of the shelter offered by the different islands, and whenever they come to a rough place, they paddle furiously. They can keep up this stroke for hours, and they're fatalists. They're great warriors. Thank you. 
hold a three-day celebration. This gives them an opportunity to prepare the skulls to place in their skull houses. They keep only the skull. The flesh is removed. Back on Bilwa, the women are overjoyed to see so many of the warriors returning from this raid. There was great rejoicing when they found that Nebu had been rescued unharmed and she's led ashore by a young chief. The boys are kept prisoners so that if any heads are needed in a hurry, they won't have to go on a raid. The islands of the Western Pacific cast a strange spell over a white man at any time. Particularly is this true if the white man is witnessing the return of a victorious tribe of headhunters from a raid. The queer chant and the very weird ceremony sends a strange sensation up and down a white man's spine. I can't describe that sensation. You've just got to go down there and find out for yourselves. The warriors bring the skulls ashore wrapped in leaves. And there's one more ceremony that must be performed before the skulls are placed in the shrines. This consists of placing the skulls on the beach in a large pile. And then they dance, a dance around this pile of skulls that is dedicated to their Uri Uri, their god. In this dance, they tell the story of the raid, how they attacked the uh, Savo Islanders, how they killed the men, women, and girl children, and how they brought back these skulls to present to their great god. There are a great many of these skull houses in this part of the Solomon Island group. Some of them are very pretentious, others mere lean-tubes. But every headhunter takes this religion very seriously. And it would be sacrilegious for him to keep any of the victim's possessions. All the victim's shell money and ornaments are tied to the skull with coconut fiber. And they'll remain there as long as the warrior who owns the skull house lives. Gao is at peace now, at peace until another raid.